Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. I want to begin this morning by reading a short parable by a, written by a 19th century German philosopher by the name of, of Arthur Schopenhauer, and you're thinking, that's what pastors do. They preach on Sunday, and they read German philosophers the rest of the week. Uh, <laughs> not true. I'd probably read French philosophers or something like that. Uh, it's the parable of the porcupine. Some of you may have heard this one. On a cold winter's day, a group of porcupines huddled together to stay warm and keep from freezing. But soon they felt one another's quills and moved apart. When the need for warmth was when the need for warmth brought them closer together again, their quills forced them apart. They were driven back and forth at the mercy of their discomforts until they found the distance from one, one another that provided both a maximum of warmth and a minimum of pain. Uh, Schopenhauer uses this parable to describe human relationships, and he goes on to explain, in human beings, the emptiness and monotony of the isolated self produces a need for society. This brings people together, but their many offensive qualities and intolerable faults drive them apart. The optimum distance that they finally find that permits them to coexist is embodied in politeness and good manners. Because of this distance between us, we can only partially satisfy our need for warmth, but at the same time, we are spared the stab of one another's quills. Uh, Schopenhauer's parable cleverly illustrates the human dilemma. That on the one hand, there is a desire and a need for community. It's how we're made. On the other hand, we're wary of getting too close to others because we're afraid of being hurt, even hurt badly. As I pointed out in the past, something really leaps off the pages of the opening chapters of Genesis. That among the litany of good, so and, and the Lord saw that it was good, and the Lord saw that it was good, and the Lord saw that it was good, even very good, comes this startling revelation, it is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. And so, as you know, the Lord creates Eve for, for Adam and that in the beginning, they were able to draw closely to one another, literally and figuratively, skin to skin, and there was no pain. But all of that changed after the fall due to their disobedience. Human relationships were fundamentally changed pain entered the human dynamic, the human relationship equation, as it were. And as a result, all of us find ourselves drawn to others and repulsed from them. We find ourselves fearing the very thing that we long for, community, a sense of connectedness. There are several different ways that you and I can deal with the push-me-pull-me tension that we feel when it comes to our desire for community. And for our purposes today, I would like for us to consider three of these approaches. One is keep your distance, okay? Put your hand like that, keep your distance, okay? And pretend that you, you've got the ball, it's a stiff arm, it's like minimize the risk. And then the last one is it's embrace the pain. So keep the distance, Minimize the risk and then embrace the pain. So technology, especially modern social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and others, they allow us to keep our distance. Uh, they allow us to have friends, but to have friends where we're really not very close to their quills. That we can watch each other's lives unfold through a series of posts and pictures and likes. And without detection, we can ignore their political rants. 
Uh, we can gloss over the endless cat pictures. <laughs> and we can simply ignore whatever they had for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Uh, Philip Toledano captures the essence of the keep your distance approach in an article that he wrote for the Atlantic Monthly. He writes in part, our omnipresent new technologies lure us toward increasingly superficial connections at exactly the same moment that they make avoiding the mess, or we would say the pain of human interaction, easy. The beauty of Facebook, the source of its power, is that it enables us to be social while sparing us the embarrassing reality of society. The accidental revelations we make at parties, the awkward pauses, the farting and the spilled drinks, and the general gauchery of face-to-face -face contact. Instead, we have the lovely smooth smoothness of a seemingly social machine, everything so simple, status updates, pictures, your wall. Please understand, these, these are relatively frictionless relationships, but they also aren't, also aren't very warm relationships. That they're wonderful at keeping us out of harm's way, keeping us away from each other's quills, but they do not and they cannot provide us the warmth that all of us need and all of us desire. So that was the, the keep your distance. Now on to the <clears throat> minimize the risk. And I'm not going to say too much about it because I think Schopenhauer's parable of the porcupines well illustrates uh, minimizing the risk. But I would say this, that in order to minimize the risk, we are encouraged to get close to others, but not too close. And as a result, we have many acquaintances, but few, if any, true friends. That we spend time with others, but not too much time. We share with them, but not too deeply. We invest in them, but not too heavily. After all, we don't want to make too great a commitment to them, because someday they might ask us for something that we're not willing to give. Or heaven forbid that we would invest in others and in our time of need, we would get absolutely nothing in return. Keep your distance. Minimize the risk. Here we go. Embrace the pain. Let's be honest that of the three options, that's the least attractive. <laughs> and it really kind of wars against our, our sense of self-preservation. That if we have been hurt by others repeatedly, that if we still have very deep wounds and if we still have very pronounced scars, the idea of putting ourselves in a position whereby others can hurt us, we're simply not very interested. It seems rather sadistic if we would engage in such things, but the truth is that true community, Christian community, requires us and even demands that we embrace the pain. Now, please don't misunderstand what, what I'm saying. I'm not saying that if you're in an abusive relationship, you ought to remain in an abusive relationship. That if you are being emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, you need to separate yourself from those who are inflicting the pain. That wisdom would say, under those circumstances, it is the right thing to do to put a barrier between you and those who are perpetrating the pain. So that is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that true community, all the blessings of Christian community, cannot be experienced at a distance. That the only way in which we experience the warmth of genuine community is that we put ourselves in harm's way. 
that we get close enough to one another whereby we can feel each other's quills. We put ourselves close enough to one another recognizing that there will be times and moments when we poke and we prick and we stab each other with our quills. But there shouldn't be any pricking or poking and stabbing among God's people, should there be? You know, it's interesting growing up in the church, and if you come on Sundays and you sit in the pew and you go to a few other things, you know, most people are, you know, in the boundaries of politeness and good manners, and so you really don't, oh, everybody, isn't this wonderful? And then you get into leadership. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the curtain is pulled back, and you're like, holy moly, that is ugly. You know, so sometimes we have, we, we have the sense that, that, oh, we're all Christians, and of course we all get along well. You know, that's that pie-in-the-sky kind of dream. But that simply isn't the reality. And I think today's text really uh, goes a long way in dispelling that notion. It begins with, with a command. It begins with a command with bear with each other. And why is it that we need to bear with each other? Because at times we can be bears, <laughs> right? Uh, may, maybe we didn't sleep well. Maybe we're hangry. Uh, maybe we are... Uh, stressed out by all the things that are happening in life. Maybe we just woke up in a bad mood. Maybe we don't like what's being said and done or what's left being said undone and left undone, and so we let loose or we're loosed upon. And then we have to make a decision. What are we going to do? And I think our initial reaction when we're loosed upon is like, I'm out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. And while in the moment, depending on, you know, how many organs they're venting at you at that particular moment, you know, probably uh, separating yourself is a good thing because you or I might say things that we, we, we live to regret. But ultimately, the call is that we need to draw closely again and to forgive even as the Lord forgave us. Jesus not only calls us into community with one another, but he calls us into community with himself. I mean, that's one of the things we touched upon in our series thus far on Colossians. In the second chapter, I mean, when you stop to think about it, it, it's so wonderful. It says that, that we were created by Jesus for Jesus that we were created by Jesus for a relationship with Jesus. But sin royally messed all that up. And yet Jesus didn't give up. Jesus didn't keep his distance. He didn't seek to minimize the risk, but rather Jesus embraced the pain. In fact, the closer that Jesus became to humanity, the more painful it became for him. You think Jesus was ever disappointed in people? I mean, if the gospel accounts are any record, it seems like hourly he was disappointed with his disciples because they were not living up to his expectations. Jesus experienced the pain of betrayal, even by one of his closest friends. Jesus experienced the pain of misunderstanding. Even his own family thought he was crazy. Jesus experienced the, the, the pain of false accusations. Jesus experienced the, the, the pain of forsakenness. Jesus experienced physical pain. Jesus experienced slaps and punches. Jesus experienced the pain of the, the scourges talons. And the nails? Yes, Jesus embraced the pain. Instead of retreating, Jesus allowed our quills to poke into his tender flesh. Instead of shrinking from it, Jesus allowed himself to be pierced literally for our sins. And why would it be that Jesus, God himself, would embrace the pain. 
he deemed us worthy. He saw each of us as worth the suffering and the sorrow, the pain associated with that. Think of Hebrews chapter 12. There's that section, most of us know it well. It says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. That Jesus endured the cross for the joy of restoring our relationship with him and for the joy of restoring our relationships with one another because our relationships with each other are predicated on our relationship with Jesus. The theme of our series on Colossians is it's all about Jesus And it truly is all about Jesus. And in our text today, we see the essential role that Jesus plays in our life together. Our life together is prickly porcupines. Three times uh, it stresses that. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell among you richly. And then verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Do you see the importance of Jesus in our life together? Someone wrote, where the word of Christ dwells, the peace of Christ rules. Where the word of Christ dwells, the peace of Christ rules. And in both cases... Gratitude, not grumbling, is the characteristic, it's the hallmark characteristic of community, of life together. In other words, where God's people are continually reminded of the word of Christ, the message of grace, the message of forgiveness, the message of new beginnings, then the peace of Christ rules. And where the priests, uh, peace, priests, <laughs> I can't even speak, and where the peace of Christ rules porcupines, that's us, are enabled to live together closely, intimately, even gratefully. When it comes to relationships, even in the church, or maybe especially in the church, it's tempting to keep our distance. It's tempting to minimize the risk, but as Schopenhauer's parable of the porcupines points out, that such an approach leaves us longing, longing for more. And the more, and the more can only be experienced by placing ourselves in harm's way, by placing ourselves close enough to each other where we can poke each other with our quills. I was going to make a whole porcupine outfit for today, but I just didn't have time. I'm sure it would have been one of the more memorable ones. Why didn't you? Why didn't I? I had a busy week. Thank you. I was reading German philosophers. So here we go. Uh, If we are willing to take the risk, if we are willing to accept the pain that comes from drawing closely to others, we eventually discover that there is no other place we'd rather be than together. Yes, there are disagreements and conflicts. Yes, there are disappointments and hurt feelings. But there is a warmth, a joy, a richness, a genuine comfort, an indescribable sense of belonging that is found only in our life together, brought together and held together by Christ himself. Let us pray. Fathers, we think about the course of our lives. Many of us, if not most of us, have been hurt the most by other members of the body of Christ. They have said or done things in our presence or behind our backs. They have uh, done things unintentionally and gleefully. And you know that when those things have transpired, especially when they have been done time after time again, our sense of self-preservation causes us to just want to put as much distance as possible between us and them. Or at the very least, we want to stiff arm them. We we want to minimize their ability to continue to poke us with their sharp quills. 
And while there is a sense that that is what we want to do, we also find ourselves missing out on the warmth that is found only in life together. And so we pray that you would, by your Spirit, enable us to embrace the pain, to know that as we live life together under the cross, that we are not always going to agree, we are not even going to like each other all the time, and yet you have called us into one body. And so we pray that as you embrace the pain for us, even unto death, that you would enable us by your Spirit to live together closely, intimately, even if at times painfully. That as we live life together, we would discover, despite the pricks and the pokes and the stabs, there is no place that we would rather be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.